Simon Woodhouse purchased Carol in December 2004. She's a stunning 30s racing yacht with a fascinating history, and he fell in love with her on the spot. This was the one to go and spend some money on. It was my dream boat, and it was to, to head across oceans on. Um, she was the dream. He works as a chef down the road in Southampton, and he plans to sail a boat to the Mediterranean and set up his own seafood restaurant. The ultimate goal for me is to head off across the seas and, and cook on super yachts, and this was the vehicle to get me there. But when Simon stripped the paint off inside, he found a horror story. We're already starting to see this, this blackness, but we've got to get rid of this because it will spread like a cancer through the boat. And before he knew it, she was being pulled out of the water with a major reconstruction project looming. Suddenly, Simon's plans of crossing the ocean seemed a million miles away. I'm talking to clever people and them than myself on these issues, people that have um, rebuilt boats, shipwrights that I know, pulling together any information I can to get a, an appraisal of what's happening. And it does seem to be um, a big job. And with any large-scale work on a boat of this kind, there's a cost complication that doesn't bear thinking about. I can afford the bills, but there's not a lot of spare around. Simon borrowed the money to buy Carol, which means he's now going to have to sell his previous smaller boat and his precious MG. So the mission is to find the money to fund the next six months' work. Because he can't afford to pay a professional boat builder, he's decided to attack the problem head on and do the work himself. And with the aid of some friends, plus some DIY financing, he hopes to get the boat back in the water in time for some autumn sailing. Yeah, shattered dreams at the moment, but with the middle of that, we'll, we'll get a sailing again. So I decided to meet Simon a week after Carol came out of the water, partly to discover exactly what the problems were, but also to find out what sort of a man was willing to undertake such a daunting task. Well, shall we Come go and have a look at the boat shall then? Shall we? Turn yeah. the corner. OK. You know, if this is the boat I think she is, uh, I've known her all my sailing life. She's been around, and um, let's... Oh, as far as yes. I know, there's only one of them. Yes, it is! It's her! Wow, it's the one. she looks lovely. What a class act. You must be well chuffed. Bit of a pro tech, though, isn't it? Looking at her right now, she looks pretty good, but uh, you're telling me all the interesting stuff's inside. Yeah, a lot hidden, a lot hidden. That's how it works. You know, it's good to see her there. I first saw your boat in 1980. The thing that I really remember about her, the one incident that really sticks in my mind about this boat, is meeting her in the Caribbean. And she was sitting there, anchored under a palm tree. And the sea, of course, is deep blue when you're out in the Caribbean. As you come into the anchorage, it all goes pale green on the white sand. And she was just sitting there, as light as air. And I haven't seen her since. The vision of her being out there on the, on the crystal waters, yeah. Magic. That's Magic. where she longs to be. Well, yeah, see if we can get her back there. Eh? What, what's happening with her? I mean, she looks all right to me. She's got some problems internally. There's softness, there's, there's rot, there's, yeah. Some Is that in the framing? Soft. In the frames. It's easily, it happens so plate. often, you know. When it comes to maintenance, the sea doesn't take any prisoners. Oh, it's a wonderful a, thing she's here, and... Uh, she's a fine thing. And if your plans go right, you'll be taking her back on the big seas again. The mission is, yeah, back to the Caribbean, back to somewhere. Go make a living on boats. Well, let's get a bit closer, shall we? Built in 1937 by Harry King over on the East Coast, the boat started out at the top of the tree, raced by Muriel Wiles, a sort of pre-war Ellen MacArthur. She had many first-class racing wins. Then she changed tack and became a cruiser. Now, some would say she's got an expensive pedigree, but over the years, this boat has become classless. What'd you pay for her? Can I ask? Ooh, I know one top. gent doesn't ask another what he paid for his yacht. But... I still think, I've got problems with her, I still think I've got a bargain. I've paid 18,000, which... Well, you did really well. I mean, depending I on what so. we find inside there, but it can't, uh, it can't be that bad because of what we're seeing outside. 18 grand might sound like a lot of money, but the equivalent modern yacht made of fiberglass would set you back more than any working man could pay. Try a hundred thousand pounds for size. And of course, you haven't bought her for the, for the money, have you? You've no, bought her, you've bought she's her not for sale, on. I guess. It's the, it's the statement, Wonderful. she's not for sale. Yeah, that's no, she's fabulous. Well, we the construction down? of a wooden See, boat the, is the an intricate and yeah, arduous yeah, process. In Carol's case, it combines long, large planks riveted and screwed into a framework of wooden ribs that give the boat shape and strength. Yeah, it's fascinating when you see a boat like this, when she hasn't been all painted up, and you can see the guts of her, really, isn't it? You know, you can see every plank in her, and people who've only dealt with fiberglass boats, they sort of imagine that a boat's a, a monocoque construction, really, and a fiberglass boat is. It's all one piece, but this is something different. This is a sort of, like a do-it-yourself boat kit, almost, except it's, there's a 
I don't know, there must be 10,000 unit parts in this boat. And if one unit fails, then you've got some problems. But and it was these problems that I was keen to investigate. Yeah. And Carol looks in deceptively fine fettle. But if what I've been led to believe is as serious as it sounds, she's got as much chance of sailing the high seas as a rusty bucket with a hole in it. The problem that I've got is that iron and oak don't go together when the salt water around. We've got softness in the wood, it's got carbonisation, you flake it away with, with your fingers. Oh, I've seen that Black. before. Yeah. yeah. The thing that we don't know at the moment is how far this reaction yeah. with the iron has gone into yes. the keel timbers. Well, people don't understand, I mean, you obviously do because you're a sailor, but a lot of people don't understand that that great big mast is producing all the horsepower necessary to sure. shove this boat straight sure. up to windward at six sure. or seven knots. It's a massive uh, amount Never mind power. the physical weight of this mast. All that drives yeah. down like a pile driver, plus it's ramming the boat forward sure. at all that speed. Sure. It's all on this ironwork. The ironwork that holds the frames to the boat's backbone is the core of her skeleton. And if the wood and the metal have conspired against Carol and reacted together to produce a horrible, rotting mess, Simon is going to have his work cut out. Well, she's still looking good here, Simon. Come on in. We've got a 30s boat with a 1950s interior. But such fabulous quality. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah. The old important alcohol lockers. <laughs> and what I'm looking at is a little time warp, really. This boat's never been spoiled, has she? Carol was designed to carry six people comfortably at speed, across oceans if need be, and it was becoming more obvious to me why Simon had fallen for this boat. There's not much not to like, is there? Where are the horrors? Down below. Mate, with the horrors? Down below, come on. <laughs> Finally, I was about to discover what it was that had transformed Carol from a race-winning yacht to a boat that could sink oh, at yeah, any minute. Yeah. So it's the original frames. Yeah. They've obviously found this rot in history, in the past, and they've they fixed it. They've put in sisters, a secondary frame. Yeah, they're came. called sister frames because they sit like sisters they alongside sit. each other, don't they? Yeah, there's another one here. That's yeah. right. What they didn't do was chop out the old timbers and remove the rot. And we have to solve it. We've got to get rid of this because it will spread like a cancer through the boat. It's the sort of thing that when you look at it, it makes your stomach turn over. And ultimately, that's enough to sink the boat. Yeah. If you're sailing, would you even notice before it's too late? It's, uh, it's a worry, isn't it? Mm. Simon's problem is that throughout Carol's history, her owners have taken remedial action That's to strengthen the, the frames, but and they've not addressed the rot. Yeah, it's a bit of a classic situation, this, really. Uh, you didn't have a survey, actually, did you, Simon? No, I didn't, Tom. I've got to say I didn't. And I think, given your circumstances, that uh, uh, you were getting a, the boat, a wonderful boat, at a very good price. You knew the owner to be an honest man, and, and you stood on your own judgment. Yes. And now you're prepared to take a bit of this on the chin. Sure. Anybody taking on a boat of this nature would be unwise not to have a survey. Thank goodness it hasn't gone into the planking, because it'd be okay. such a sin to replace those planks. Oh, absolutely. I think, sure. I, think, I think you're absolutely right to take it out and make sure. Really, Simon's only got one option, to rip out the offending frames. And because good oak of the thickness he requires is so difficult to come by this these days, I'd suggest that he uses laminated strips of Iroko to build up the new frames. It'd be wise to take that one out as well. Uh, in order to check the planking, which that's in right. a sense, that's the main event, isn't it? That's and uh, we hope, because we can replace those, that's part of the do-it-yourself boat kit. That's it. Once the frames are out, Simon can satisfy himself that the planks have not been affected by the rot. And I was even given the honour of inaugurating the renovation. Looks like the start of the job, Simon. With a bit of luck, the planks will be all right. If not, there may be remedial action, but we can't hope for too much because the floor of the ocean is paved with the bones of optimists. <laughs> It was with this positive attitude that we needed to explore further into the boat as I was about to find out the real crux of the problem. Yeah, aha, uh -huh. oh my. Yeah, well, immediately you can see that what's happening here is we've got metalwork and wood and the two don't always sit very nicely along. They're not getting on, are they? No, they're not getting on at all. And the thing is, looking at it, you can see this is Sure. This box work here is steel, isn't it? Sure, sure. And it's gone rusty and it's taking the wood with it. Yes. And now we have to make it good. But my goodness, there's a job to do here. So this is where the main issue lies for Carol. Very, very important to and before Simon can even get to it, he's got to pull out all of this lovely original furniture. It's no good having some nice furniture if what's underneath it is no. punk and rotten, isn't it? That's right. I'm looking down here and it's difficult to see just by looking at it, what's metal and what's not. Yeah, it's a bit of a mash, isn't it? Yeah. The carbonisation caused by a reaction between the acid and the oak and the salt water and the steel frames is a killer of wooden boats. 
and Kerel is a danger at sea unless all of the metal is replaced immediately. The important thing is to get it out as quickly as possible and get it sourced and moving, because if you want to be sailing by the end of the summer, this sort of job, just getting that job done, Yes. while you're doing all the woodwork and everything, somebody's got to be working That's on right. this. Right. Give that to the specialists, let them get on with that. Yeah, but it's got to go, because we have to have full access to all this lot. I could tell that Simon was beginning to understand the enormity of this job. Cheers. Cheers. And sensing the weight of the world on his shoulders, I was keen to keep his spirits up. It's like climbing a mountain. I stand at the bottom and I look at the top and I think, oh my goodness, sure. I'll never get there. Writing a book's the same, sure. but you have to take it chapter by chapter. And taking that furniture out, it's only chapter one, isn't sure. it, really? That's it. But when you're first confronted with it and the boat's got stuff in and there's all the crud of ages, mm -hmm. it's very, very disheartening. But once everything's out and it's clean, you yes. can see your way through, you can see your way to the end, but the early stages are pretty grim and it's important not to lose heart. Well, you could say that Simon has been more than a bit unlucky. He bought what he thought was a going concern. Poor guy, he thought he was going to sail away and now he finds he's got a lovely wooden boat with massive structural problems. It's a big project for three months. Maybe he'll still be here when the winter snow starts falling. But Simon is a passionate man, and I've no doubt he'll give it his best shot. The question is, will he be able to finance the project, find the time between his busy work schedule, and still have enough energy to deal with those unexpected problems? I spent everything I had to buy a beautiful boat, and now look at it, it's very far away from that image that I'd bought into.